Hey everyone, welcome back to Abstract Algebra 1. This will be part B of Lecture 9. When we left off a moment ago, we were discussing how um, the left cosets of a, a subgroup H of G actually create a partition of G, right? And specifically a partition where all of the parts of the partition are of equal size. Okay, and we had this example here from uh, previous, previous in, previously in the lecture where we started with a subgroup H036 in the group Z9 under uh, ordinary addition modulo 9. All right, so this would be the entirety of the group here, 0 through 8. And this, the left cosets of H036 would partition Z9 down into 0, 0,3,6, 147, and 258. Right, and specifically these three le these three left cosets would be equal to this one. These three left cosets are here, and these three left cosets are here. Right, and we said further, obviously, if you have this kind of situation, you can you can actually see that the cosets partition G into equivalence classes. And we said that the relation there is that A is equivalent to B if and only if AH equals BH, i.e., the left cosets generated by A and B are the same. Okay. So this, this is very valuable in practice. In practice, you can choose an H so that G is partitioned in some very desirable manner. This is valuable in practice. This is valuable This is valuable in practice as you can choose an H so that G is partitioned in a useful way. Okay, let's see an example of that. This is a great example, I think. Let's um, let's let G equal the group of let's see. So we've got the set A B C such that A B and C are real numbers. Oops. Basically, oh geez. Hold on. We're gonna let G equal the set. It's the group of ordered triples in the real in the in the real three space. Okay. Under addition, vector addition. Okay, so G is a group. Right? So I've got basically all of the points in three space under addition forms a group. Okay? And we're gonna let H be a plane, right? So it's obviously going to be a sub group of this group. It's going to be a plane through the origin. Can you picture this? Right? So you've got the group, which is all of the points in three dimensional space under addition. And then you can let H be a subset of, of the, all of those three-dimensional points that, i.e., a flat plane that goes through the origin. It doesn't have to be a flat plane necessarily, just a plane that passes through the origin. Okay. Let me put this over. Okay, so I've got my G, which is A, B, C, such that A, B, C are real numbers. And then we're talking about vector addition there. And then H is just going to be any subset in the three dimensional space that would be, you know, would fall on a, onto a particular plane. Okay. Okay, so then if I for every element in in G, so for any A B C, what is this? What is this left coset? Right? A B C plus H is going to be the plane passing through It's 
going to be the plane passing through the point ABC, right? And it's going to be parallel to the original plane. Well, that's very precise, isn't it? All right, that's very precise. So in three space, probably do a terrible job drawing this, but let's say I've got my three three space. If this is my origin plane, right, it cuts through the origin, then A B and maybe A B C is up here. Then what I'm going to be in, what I end up doing is defining a new plane, All right? And if another A B C is up further. And define another plane, right? And so this is obviously a uh, you know G is an infinite group. It's a group of, of order of infinite order, right? And so there's infinitely many planes that can be uh, identified here, right? But you can see how this would be this could be potentially useful. The cosets of H are going to constitute a partition of R three into a series of uh, planes parallel to H. Right, so the cosets of H will uh, constitute a partition of R three um, into, you know, a series of planes parallel to H. So this is like my original H down here, for example. Right, and of course, I just drew it flat because it's hard to draw otherwise. But you can imagine the planes could be tilted in any which, any orientation you like. Okay, so that's a great example. Okay, great example of this idea of a coset being used. Another example. Um, let's let. So if G is equal to G L, this is a matrix group. GL 2R, and then we're going to use matrix multiplication, which I'll denote like this. Now, what is this? These are the uh, two by two matrices with non zero determinants. Okay, so if you've had linear algebra, you know what I'm talking about here GL 2R. And then Let's so that's that's G, and let's let H be SL two R. Similar group, again under matrix multiplication. Except here we're talking two by two matrices uh, with determinant equal to one. So special linear, general linear, SL and GL. So non-zero determinants and determinants of equal to equal to one. Okay, let's talk about the cosets of H here in G. So for any A in GL two R, right? The coset. What does the coset look like? The coset A H is going to be the set of all two by two matrices with the same determinant as A. Right, why is that? Why is that? Well, H, remember, has uh, all of the matrices in H have a determinant equal to one, right? And all of the matrices in G have a non-zero determinant. So if I take an a, a matrix A out of G, it's going to have some non-zero determinant. Then the coset A times H is going to be the set of all two by two matrices with the same determinant as A, right? Because everything over here has the determinant of one. And when I multiply anything over here by A, I get a determinant of equal to the determinant of A. Why is that? Think about your linear algebra here. What's the determinant of A times a matrix H? Well, since they have non-zero determinants, it looks like this, doesn't it? Right, and so that's what you get right there. 
right? And so H is obviously an infinite subset of matrices, right? So multiplied by A, you're going to get an infinite range. You're going to get an infinite variety of matrices that all have the same determinant as the matrix A. Very cool, right? Right. And a kind of a slightly more concrete example here would be things like. Let's think about two zero zero one times H. Right, so this matrix here would be like the A has a has a determinant of two. This right here is the set of all two by two matrices with determinant equal to two. Okay. And so that is also a very cool example of a coset of, of you know using the cosets to kind of break up a very um, large and complex group into something quite useful. Okay. All right. So we've seen a bunch of examples of cosets, and now it's time to kind of jump to the main theme of the, the main topic of the of the section, and that is Lagrange's theorem. Okay, this is Lagrange's theorem. Okay, so what does Lagrange's theorem say? It says if G is a finite group G is a finite group and H is a subgroup of G H is a subgroup of G, then the order of H, the subgroup, divides the order of G. Okay, so the order of the subgroup, the number of elements in the subgroup, whatever number that is, it's going to divide the number of elements in the group itself. And then moreover, the number of distinct distinct left cosets, and we'll say left or right cosets, right? The left and right cosets of H and G is that division G over H. Order of G divided by the order of H is equal to the number of left cosets of H. All right, very good. So that's kind of a deep theorem right there, right? It tells you something very specific about the subgroups of G. It says, hey, um, if you're considering a subset and wondering whether or not it's a subgroup, first thing to look at is how many elements are in it. If, 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 you know, if G has 10 elements and your potential candidate subgroup has three, then there's no way it's a subgroup. You don't have to go any further tell right there because 3 does not divide 10. Okay, so that's kind of the idea behind Lagrange's theorem, at least the first part. And the second part just kind of takes the concept, which we'll see flushed out in the proof here, uh, and it says, in fact, if you take the size of the group and you divide it by the size of the subgroup, then that's going to tell you, that division will tell you how many cosets of H there are, distinct cosets. Let's prove this theorem. Let's prove it. So let's uh, to do this. Let's let a one h, a two h, dot dot dot, a r h, denote the distinct left cosets of h. Okay, however many there happen to be, call it r. Okay. <clears throat> okay, then for each A in G, so an element A in the group, we have AH equals AIH for some I, 
right? What are we saying here? Well, all we're saying is that, hey, if you give me an A um, and I multiply it and I generate a left sub uh, left coset off of A, it's going to be equal to one of these, right? Because these are all of the distincts, right? So AH is equal to AIH for some I. That's all that's saying. Now, by property one of the previous theorem, What was property one? Property one said that A is in AH. Okay, so by property one of the previous theorem, we have this. A is in AH. Okay. So each member of G, every element, right, is going to belong to one of the cosets. This is going to imply that every element of G is in some is in one of the AIH cosets. Right, so it can't, so the element can't be in more than one, otherwise they wouldn't be distinct. And remember we had a pro property that said that uh, you know the cosets are all either two cosets are either identical or else they have nothing in common, right? So that kind of follows, right? So each member of G belongs to one of the cosets A I H. Now let's sort of jump to some some actual mathematical notation because we're going to have to do some work here. So in notation, what we would say is that G is equal to A one H or A two H or dot 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 or a R H. Okay. Now, property three, uh, what we were just discussing, says that hey, look, these because these are all distinct, they must be disjoint. Because these are all distinct, they must be disjoint. Meaning, there's there are there's no overlap between these elements. And so, what does that mean? Well, that implies that the size of G must be equal to the size of A1H plus size of A2H plus, right, all of these. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, property five, what was property five again? It said that two cosets have the same size, right? By property five, a one h equals a two h equals dot 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 equals a r h. They're all the same size, right? So that means I can actually simplify this sum, and I instead I could write uh, g is equal to r times h. Right now, why H? Well, because, so note, AIH, the size of AIH is equal to the size of AJH, which is equal to the size of H. Okay. And so this guy right here is really the key. Right? If I just do a little algebra here, I can see that R is equal to G over H, right? R being the number of distinct cosets, right? And R is obviously a whole number, so that means G must be divisible by H. Since R is a natural number, we'll say. Okay, and so that's the proof. There it is. Very straightforward, pretty simple uh, little argument. Um, would not be at all uh, easy to prove if we didn't have cosets, right? And if cosets didn't have such amazing uh, and easy to run work with properties.
Okay, so I mean, I think and I mentioned this up ahead, uh, ahead of the section, but you know, Lagrange's theorem is a subgroup candidate theorem, right? If you have, so Lagrange's theorem is a subgroup candidate theorem, right? If you have, like, let's say you have an, a group whose order is 12, then the only possible orders of subgroups would be whatever divides 12. You know, so it'd be like 12 over 2 or you know equal 6 right so you could you'd, you could be looking for an, a subgroup of order 2 you could be looking for a subgroup of order 1 of course the identity you could be looking for a subgroup of order 4 3 6 or 12 so in total it'd be what 12 6 4 3 2 or 1 any any subgroup candidate that's got a number of elements outside of this this range here it could not possibly be a subgroup okay cool very useful right that's one of the main uses um, so in the in the proof we came across this r equals g over h if you take the order of the group you divide it by the order of the subgroup you get this number r and we said that that's the number of distinct cosets that was the number of distinct cosets this uh this number is used pretty regularly in group theory and it has a name we call it the index of h R is called the index of H and G. All right, so the index of a subgroup is the number of distinct cosets that can be generated using it uh, can be generated using the subgroup. Okay, and we'll sometimes denote this as uh, using this notation G. Right, so this would be the index of H and G would be denoted like this. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, um, this theorem of Lagrange's spins off a whole bunch of nice corollaries. We're just going to kind of rip through them here at the end of the lecture. For the end of the lecture, we'll uh, just kind of look through these, and some of them are very interesting. Some of them are so such immediate corollaries that we're not even going to worry about proving them, but others will be somewhat less obvious and might require a little bit of a proof. So, a few corollaries. So, corollary one. Right, if G is a finite group and H is a subgroup. then the index of H and G, remember we denote it like that, is G over H. Now, this is, uh, I mean, just a strictly a consequence of basically the last proof that we looked at. That argument can be used to generate this, right? Just by definition of the index of H and G, okay? So that one is, straightforward comes out of the previous theorem now in a finite group the second corollary in a finite group in a finite group the order of each element of the group the order of each element of the group divides the order of the group Hmm. Okay, so how is that? Right? How is that? How does that how is that a, a quick corollary? 
Well, it's all to do with this idea of a finite group. Right now, if A is in G, then the order of A is equal to the order of the group generated by A. Right? Which implies, right, because this is a subgroup, it implies that um, the order of that subgroup divides G by Lagrange's theorem, right? So in a finite group, the order of each element of the group divides the order of the group, right? So remember, in a finite group, I can spin up a subgroup based on an element, right? And it's a cyclic group if that spin up equals the whole group. But I can always create a subgroup like this, right? And subgroups, the order of sub subgroups must divide the order of the group. And so that's what we're saying. And, and in fact, the order of the element tells you the size of the subgroup generated by the element. That size is divisible, divides G, and so the order of the element itself must divide G. Right? So it's a sneaky little corollary, but it's it's legit. Okay. <clears throat> corollary three, another one we get here. So a group of prime order must be cyclic. Hmm, how's that work? It's probably going to have to do with something similar to what we just discussed, right? Well, let's let the order of the group equal P, a prime. We'll let A be in G, and we'll assume that A is not equal to the identity. Okay. What do we got? Then the order of the subgroup generated by A must divide the order of G, right? And we know that the order of A is not equal to 1 since A is not E. This, these two together imply that the order of A equals the order of G, right? Because the only thing that divides a prime is itself and one, right? Now, if the or, if the order of of the cyclic of this subgroup divides G and the order is not one, then the orders must be the same. If the orders are the same, uh, G must be cyclic, meaning that A equals G. Nice, very nice. Again, a sneaky little corollary that uses uh, Lagrange's theorem in a very smart way. Excellent. Corollary four. Okay. In this case, let's say, let's let G be a finite group. Let G be a finite group and let A, B, and G okay. then what the, the theorem says is that A raised to the order of G is equal to E. Okay. Okay. So let's prove this one. What is this one? How is this? Where's this come from? Well, remember, corollary two said that the order of each element of the group divides the order of the group, right? So by corollary two, by corollary two, the order of the group is equal to the order of a times some k. All right, k is some positive integer. Okay. Right, so that means that a raised to the g power is equal to a raised to the order of a times k power, which is equal to a raised to the order of a 
to the k power, and of course a raised to the order of a is equal to the identity. Okay, and there we go. Again, nice little little add-on there. Right, so Lagrange's theorem is far-reaching. There's a lot of little things that it really helps with. It helps. Uh, and here is the last example, and here's another little thing that uh, uh, Lagrange's theorem helps with, and that is Fermat, Fermat's little theorem, which, upon its release, was not a theorem about group theory, but can be proven uh, in the language of group theory. Right. So for every a, what does the theorem say? For every integer a and every prime p, we have a raised to the p power mod p is equal to a time a mod p. A raised to the p power mod p is equal to a mod p, right? So if I take a number uh, and I raise it to, so if I take like 5 raised to the 7th power mod 7 is equal to 5 mod 7, for example. Okay, so this is Fermat's little theorem, right? If I take an, if I take an, an, an integer and I raise it to a prime power uh, it's going to be equal to itself mod p. Okay, what's the proof here? Why bring this up here? Well, by the division algorithm, by the division algorithm, a equals pm plus r for some r, which is less than, than p, the divisor, right? And so what does that mean? Well, that implies, of course, that a mod p is equal to r. Right? I mean, r is the remainder. a mod p, you're dividing by p. Dividing a by p, you get the remainder of r. Okay, so a mod p is equal to r. And so it suffices to show, it suffices to show that r to the p mod p equals r. Right? If r is equal to 0, obviously we don't have to worry about that, so that's trivial. So let's assume that r is non-zero. Um, so let's assume specifically that r is in up, which would be the set 1 to p minus 1. Okay. This is basically the multiplicative group uh, under multiplication mod p. So this is multiplication mod p. Okay. Then by the previous corollary, right? By the previous corollary, by the previous corollary, we had r to the p minus one power mod p. is equal to the identity in this case would be one right and of course since the order of up is p minus one and e is equal to one then r to the p minus one mod p equals one implies that r to the p mod p equals r. Right? You just kind of back everything up one. All right, and that is exactly the, the theorem, right? That's what what we are needing to show. Okay. All right. So r to the a to the p mod p is equal to a mod p. R to the p mod p is equal to r, and of course mod p. That's it. Okay, and so this is an example of using concepts from group theory to prove a theorem that uh, predates group theory. Okay, um, I think 
that will do it for this section. Now when we come back, we'll be jumping into a very cool concept uh, from Abstract Algebra uh, called external direct products. So we'll get into that next time, uh, next time we get together. So uh, until then, take care.